from legendary locals we all know to people you should get to know. Follow Ipswich Today on your favourite app and never miss an episode or go to ipswichtoday.com.au. Coming up, as the dust settles after the Ipswich Council by-election, jockeying for the Deputy Mayor spot is well underway. The first meeting of Council will also decide committees and members and deal with any urgent business held over during caretaker. Mayor Theresa Harding joins the show and will also answer why Council officers approved a controversial development in Springfield during caretaker period. It's Thursday, April 4, 2024, and I'm Alan Roebuck. Welcome to Ipswich Today, which acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which it is produced and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. This podcast is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. Thank you for speaking with Ipswich Today, Mayor Harding. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you to the listeners. And congratulations on your win. It's been a, a big couple of weeks. Councillors and yourself were officially sworn in on Tuesday night. Now, this kind of begs the question, why is there a need for a swearing in when you're already declared by the Electoral Commission? Yeah, there's a nuance in the local government. So it's a very good question. Um, so I was actually the mayor until the declaration on Thursday, but by a quirk, I'm actually the mayor-elect until sworn in. So I don't have the full powers of being the mayor. And the same with the councillors as well. Um, you know, councillors were councillors until the declarations. So like Councillor Kunzman, who didn't contest it, was basically the council until the, someone else was declared. So it was very important for us to me that to be sworn in as soon as possible. The final declarations happened on Thursday afternoon, just before Easter. So the first day back, we made sure that we were sworn in. So we have the full powers of being a council and no longer a caretaker. And being the incumbent mayor, you've already got the lines of communication open with the CEO. So quite a smooth transition. It was, and I guess I, I was back in the office the Monday after the election anyway, um, working on some things, um, especially preparing uh, for the induction of the new councillors as well, but also giving the organisation feedback that we'd heard from residents in regards to um, council communication and how we communicate better with residents. The post-election meeting and the first council meeting is on April 11. That'll be the vote for the Deputy Mayor and sorting out the committees. Any early mail on who the Deputy Mayor might be? (laughs) Yeah, look, we have very passionate councillors. So, look, at this stage, I'm not going to name any names, but there's at least three councillors who are really keen to be the, the deputy mayor. So, look, they're having discussions with the councillors because that's how it's decided. There are nine of us and um, a councillor needs to get five votes at, at least to, to secure that position. And I think the other thing that's come through from councillors is that rather than doing the rotating one year for each division, there's a keenness to either have someone there for the full four years or have two lots of two years. So, that's something that the uh, councillors and us were discussing at the moment. Are there any urgent matters that have been held over during caretaker period? No, we were very careful in the lead up to caretaker to bring forward a number of matters that we thought might require our decision. And we also delegated the CEO to make a few decisions as well. So, and we also met during caretaker. So we don't have any of that, but a couple of things that were really important that came up that we were able to deal with was the um, the decision to take ownership of the Red Bank Plains Road um, upgrade project, as well as um, council signing on the major new tenant for the Nicholas Street Precinct, the Melbourne-based entertainment company, General Public, who are going to be moving in downstairs stairs um, in the venue building alongside Hoyt. So general public is a great um, entertainery uh, concept. We've got state-of-the-art arcade games, 14 10-pin bowling lanes, golf simulators, bill- billiards tables, food and licensing spots as well. So it's a real major win for Ipswich. So it was great to see that our council was able to continue um, services and decision-making. One matter that was decided by planning officers and announced by the CEO during caretaker period was the Springview Village Development at Springfield. It's turned into quite a controversial decision. Why couldn't that decision wait for a new council to decide? That development is not impact accessible under the Planning Act or the Planning Scheme. So in council's um, policy process, which is approved by council, um, um, would allow that for council officers to make. So the council officers do make the bulk of the planning uh, decisions. So the, the background behind that is that this decision for that area to become residential was actually made in 1997 under the Springfield Land Zoning Act. So that decision was made nearly 30 years ago. So anyone wanting to stop that would actually have to either 
take that up with the state government or as the advice, I've met with many residents about this, um, the only way for them to escalate this is actually to speak to the Australian government. Some people think that council do with, make all the planning decisions. That's not actually true. It's the state and the feds are involved. But um, th that particular uh, development needs to go through the Australian government approval through, through the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So I have encouraged residents to speak to their federal MP or actually they could give direct feedback to the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water. So by what you're saying there, there's no possibility that it could be reviewed at all by councillors? Just to be clear on that, the councillors, the division of two councils and all the councils and myself uh, were briefed. We received regular uh, briefing notes uh, end of last year, early this year on the matter. Um, as I said, the decision for this area to be made residential was made in 1997. So um, council's hands are basically tied when it comes to that. That decision has already been made. It's um, So that, that land use right belongs to that land. So if anyone wants to object to that on environmental grounds or any other grounds, they actually don't have the avenue to go to through council. That needs to be done at the state level or the federal level. And that is the consistent advice that we have given many residents over the years as well. It is the start of a new term, another four years. What are your priorities in the first 100 days of this new term? Uh, obviously inducting the, the new councillors and uh, we need to bring in a budget by the end of June as well. Uh, we are one of the fastest growing areas in, in Queensland and we also have a real um, cost of living crisis happening in our community as well. A lot of people are doing it really tough. So it's going to be a real matter of, it's going to be a tough budget. It's going to be really hard to balance and, and making sure that we don't waste a cent. So it's going to be, um, I think, a really tough budget to do, but we, we're really focused on delivering for the people of, of Ipswich and we need to continue you know, those really big road projects that people need, the trunk infrastructure like the um, Springfield Parkway and the Springfield Greenback Arterial uh, duplication as well as the duplication of the Redbank Plains Road as well. And we can finally start work on the uh, Ripley and Fisher Roads upgrade in Ripley. So it's um, we really need to make sure that we continue to um, deliver this trunk infrastructure for people. Can we just wrap up this chat by talking about the election itself, Mayor Harding? There was a high informal vote for the divisions. Why do you think that was? In particular, in Ipswich, um, last election and this election have both had a high informal rate for the councillors, not so much for the mayor. Um, and I think it's because there was a by-election. In 2020, there was the by-election for Bundamba as well as the by-election for Ipswich West. So I think that you had three different voting methods. But also the the position that we're in in Ipswich, we're in a unique council uh, structure. No other council has two councillors per division. It's not working. Um, we made representation to the state government last year into the change commission. They rejected it outright. You know, I can't speak for council yet, but I think there's a, a fair appetite for us to go again, but I guess go a bit harder because uh, in 2016, when there was 10 divisions, um, each of the councils represented about 19,000 residents. Now with the growth and there's only been four divisions, uh, the, each division has over 63,000 residents and it's we've got the same staff again, council. It's, it's just too difficult and it's too big a task for the for the councillors when they've got three times the number of residents to represent. So it's really, really um, um, tough. And and we heard it back from the residents too during the election that they sometimes don't know who their councillor is or how to ca contact them. And so I think it's a it's it was a really tough thing for the councillors to do, but I, I certainly will be very focused on going back to the state government saying we do need a change and we need to have to go back to either eight or ten divisions. Do you think that's possibly part of the reason why uh, former councillors Fechner and Milligan did not get re-elected? Um, it could be. Um, there was also, under the previous council too, as we know from the windage report, a lot of money, ratepayers money was spent on advertising and promoting the councillors, whether their names were put up in signs and lights. That didn't happen under this council, so they didn't get, um, I guess, the benefit of, of that advertising, which I think was inappropriate as well. And I think the, I think the demise of the Queensland Times as well, you know, not, not having that daily mm. paper, um, so people didn't have as much exposure. Finally, there were very long queues to vote. Mm. Crunch time came at six o'clock at many booths and people inside were uh, waiting quite a while to vote after six. That's just a couple of the issues on election day. How did the Electoral Commission of Queensland get it so wrong? Look, I'm very disappointed with the Electoral Commission. Obviously, they make the decision as to what the staffing would be. Certainly last year, the feedback I had had from council that the ECQ thought that half the people or 50% would be doing early voting. I certainly gave my opinion that maximum 30 to 40% would, would early vote. And when we look at the figures in Ipswich, it was 27% did early voting. So, look, I think the ECQ ignored 
the advice from council and they, they've, they organise it. I, I was very disappointed for residents. People had come along to vote and to wait an hour or more is is not fair. Uh, people have busy lives. They've got commitments. And I was really disappointed. And on another aspect too, I had many residents come up to me during the election who would shove the how to vote card back in my chest and said, I was going to vote for you, but you can't even organise an election, so I didn't mm. vote for you. Yeah. So I do wonder if that did, if that did skew. We had a couple of, um, you know, I guess one of the councils he lost by a couple of hundred votes, you yes. know, did that impact it? So really disappointed that this, that was a really poor service level to residents. I've heard a few different stories. I don't know which one's true, but who decides the budget for the local government elections run by the ECQ? Yeah, the ECQ tell us um, what they'll be doing mm-hmm. and then council pays that fee. That was my next question. The council reimburses ECQ for the cost. So ECQ decides number of people needed, council pays whatever that is. Correct. Mayor Harding, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for speaking with Ipswich today. Thank you very much, Alan. And that's it for this episode. Don't forget to look for handy links in the show notes. Ipswich Today is supported by Kinetics people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. This podcast is listener supported. Please make a once only gift or regular donation to help keep it online. Just go to ipswichtoday.com.au. Follow and stream this podcast from your favourite app, including iHeartRadio, or play Ipswich Today on smart speakers. Music is supplied by Purple Planet Music. This is Alan Roebuck. Thank you for listening. Enjoying Ipswich today? Please share the love on your socials.